I was definitely discouraged. I don't think that I ever got to the point of giving up. At that point, I was really at my wit's end. I, I looked at this and I saw other channels who had been successful and I, I was looking at this saying, okay, the, the model works. Growing a YouTube channel works. So if something's not working, it's me. It's, 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 not, the, it's not the platform. Hey everyone, it's Anand back again. And I know I have, I have been pretty inactive on this channel for a few months, just been busy with so many projects. But I'm so excited today to bring Jason Wailing on the show because Jason is someone I, I personally look up to as a marketer. Uh, you know, ever since I made the transition on my channel as well to produce more business and marketing content, Jason is the one guy who I've really looked up to. And I personally have learned so much, especially about growing a YouTube channel. And this is what I do as an agency that, you know, I just wanted to bring him on. So Jason, welcome. Thank you so much for joining me. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for having me and that, that warm uh, that warm introduction. Humbled that uh, the videos have been so helpful. That's really the goal. Yeah, absolutely. I think, Jason, um, there's, there's a lot of other marketers out there. Uh, some are legit, some are like a bunch of fake gurus <laughs> out there. Um, but, you know, even <clears throat> amongst the legit ones, like I feel like guys like Neil Patel, they, they all have great content, but you, I feel, have a very unique, uh, you, you are able to stand out from all these people who have been making content for more than a decade now. Um, so wanted to learn a bit about like, how did you even get started on YouTube and why did you select YouTube as your platform of choice? Sure, great, great question. So quick, <laughs> quick little trip down memory lane. I actually started out as a accountant. So I interned for a big investment firm called Russell Investments for the last two years of my college. And then I went straight into a small accounting firm. And by small, I mean there were a total of 10 people in the office. And I quickly realized that I did not want to do that for the rest of my life. And so I actually jumped over to trying to be a financial advisor. I got my registered advisor license. And of course, once you get the license, you have to get clients, which means you have to learn about marketing, which I knew absolutely nothing about. And so long story short, I completely failed. Uh, the business really did not go anywhere. I maybe got a couple clients over those, those years. And I was looking at the prospect of going back and getting a job because my business just hadn't worked out. And at that point, I had just as much marketing experience as I did accounting and registered you know, investment advisor experience. And so I decided to move back to Washington where I originally went to school. And I went and worked at a marketing agency for a couple of years. And fast forward again, uh, wound up partnering up with someone who also worked at the marketing agency and we started our own marketing agency. And the main reason that I went to YouTube, um, even when I worked at the marketing agency, I was all about paid advertising. I was doing Facebook ads, I was doing Google ads. I had been trained to look down on content marketing. Um, I'd gone through one of those higher level, you know, mastermind courses that were supposed to teach you everything about marketing and paid an obscene amount of money for it when I was trying to grow my first business. And they were very anti-content. Um, they looked down on um, those who were creating content and the marketers who were talking about creating content. And so I was stuck in this broken mindset of the way to build a business is paid advertising. Well, by the end of those, you know, several years of draining the savings, not having that work, and then seeing how paid advertising played out for clients in the agency versus what the SEO and content people were doing, you know, I, I, they the results finally broke through that wall to where I had to admit that I was completely wrong, that content did have a place, that content was valuable. And I, looking at the different options I had available to me in terms of saying, okay, I'm gonna try this content thing. Um, I mean, you pretty much have, you have audio, you have written, and then you have video. And I saw, video as the greatest opportunity, especially going back and seeing some of those people that I had been taught to look down upon, have massive YouTube channels, have massive blogs. And here I'm sitting with, you know, no money in the bank because I spent it all on ads and didn't get very many clients out of it. And so that's kind of how 
I finally got on the content train and started a YouTube channel uh, originally to just grow an audience to actually under to become a better marketer. Um, and then that kind of morphed into, well, I can use this to, to grow our own agency. So that's the short version. I know I was talking a lot, but <laughs> that's the short version. Oh, that's awesome. Actually, my experience has been somewhat similar. I, I, I joined a mastermind really? about two years ago and um, I don't blame them for what they teach because you know yeah. they, they need to produce those results for the students, right? Otherwise they, they won't mm -hmm. join them. So they teach you a bunch of like direct response and you know, make that money so you can kind of invest back into them, right? Yes, exactly. So, <laughs> It is very short term thinking and, and they do look down upon like I don't even know which mastermind you joined but you know maybe we can discuss later like which one but yeah. I mean, but they all teach um, you know similar things which is just make the money in the next like they have these sprints right like 30 day I mean 90 day goals and you know yes. you get your funnel working but it's not long term thinking but then on the other side you have um, and this is a good argument they also make is, you know, content takes a long time to get results. It does. It does. And, and also it's like, it's a lot of people say content is more of a tool for branding, not so much for scaling your business. What are your thoughts about, uh, like, in terms of content, using content specifically like YouTube for branding versus as a lead generation tool? And also, how long does it take um, in your experience to see results in terms of business from from your content that's a great that's a great question and a very very valid argument because i was i was told something very similar to the the tune of well content's just for branding and it takes forever it's going to take a six to 12 months and then people you still have to do direct response anyway um so in, in terms of looking at in terms of looking at the balance, I think the the first thing is there is a difference between content for building your brand and audience, and then content for driving sales. Uh, I think I'll just use market my marketing channel as an example. You know, when I go and do a video that reviews uh, a freelancing platform like Fiverr, or goes and reviews a, a funnel software like. ClickFunnels or Kartra, Kajabi, now we have GrooveFunnels, you know, there's always something else, something new in the pipeline. Those types of, con that type of content is not gonna drive sales to our our agency. It's, it's just not, it never has, and I, I don't think it ever will. Does it attract people who might be interested in our services now or in the future? Yes, but of course that leads into the direct response marketers who say, well, yeah, that's great, maybe down the road. Like, are you just gonna keep making content because you hope that someone's going to convert in the future? So I think there's a valid argument that uh, a lot of the content that's created out there is in fact just branding and audience building. On the flip side though, if that's not important to someone, then I think that there's just as much power in creating content that demonstrates your authority and attracts the perfect or ideal, your ideal customer. As an example, we make a, our, we make a lot of videos about how to run Google ads or about how to run YouTube ads and about how to install Tag Manager and understand what the heck is going on in an analytics dashboard, right? Those videos get way less views than the ones we just talked about because everybody wants to know about the reviews. They want to know the problem, the, the negative side of using something like Fiverr or Upwork. And so those get a lot of clicks that gets a lot more engagement. And so that's great for, for branding and, and audience and awareness, right? But on the other side, when you're looking at those kind of more boring tutorials, sure, they don't get as many views, they don't get as much engagement, but those are the ones that ultimately drive sales. And so you might be in a niche or industry where you're lucky and there's an overlap between the two, um, but for the most part for us, it's it's been separate. And so when we go and create content, I think it's a balance that you have to choose between are we doing branding that's going to be longer term that really, there's there's hardly any way to, to have a KPI for 
the, the branding side of things uh, versus are we just going to go all in on creating content that we know is directly in line with the problems our ideal customers are dealing with right now. So we cement ourselves as authority so that the next time that their Google ads breaks, they go, you know what, forget it. I'm just going to hire, you know, act marketing to help me with this because I'm so frustrated and I'm done. And so I think those, that's the two ways you can kind of look at content and you can kind of satisfy the argument that yes, content is branding, but you can also go against that argument and say, yeah, but there is a way for content to actually drive sales. And I think my channel's proof that that type of content, that's what brings in the majority of our clients. So I wanted to know when you said you, uh, my viewers are mostly entrepreneurs, people looking to use social media, specifically video to grow their business that they, 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 they do care about branding because they want to stand out from the crowd. But if, if they were to make videos that you mentioned where you, they want to drive some sales, maybe they, they have some, a product or service they want to offer, how mm -hmm. should they find the right content to make that are more sales kind of videos? Great. Yeah. Great question. So that's a, that's a tough one. Um, so there are, I, I kind of like to normally I have slides in front of me, but I kind of like to think of three, there's three types of content. I can't think of the, the second one right now. Uh, but you have, you have the how to, oh, you have a how to content, then you have review content and then you have decision guides. And so depending upon whether you're a product business or a services business, you know, these are going to work more, more, some will work better, better than others. So let's go with the example of a, a local bike shop, right? You're trying to drive, get people to come in to purchase bikes. Um, so in that particular instance, doing reviews of different, uh, different bikes that you have in your shop would be, a, be, a, be an obvious one, right? Um, the second thing you could do is in terms of creating decision guides. So the questions that someone has when they're buying their first bike, for example, they're not really, most people don't know the difference between a hybrid and a road bike or how thick the tires are supposed to be. They just see bikers on the road and they go, well, I, I think I want to try biking, but they have no idea what type of bike they're supposed to choose and how, whether or not they need to really buy that $2,000 bike versus the one that's just made of aluminum versus carbon fiber or, or whatever, right? So those types of questions would be a decision guide. And so your goal is to just be helpful with the questions that come up directly in the sales process. And so I think whether you're a services business or a physical product business, those types of decision guides, just answering those questions that you most likely already know because you get them when they walk into your shop or you're having your, your sales calls, that those, that type of content where you're helping them make a decision and being as objective as possible, that's, that's really important. Being as objective as possible is a great way to bring in customers. Now, something that has been really helpful for us as a services-based business, which is a little counterintuitive, is making really in-depth how-to tutorials. And so, for example, even though we run Google ads for clients, we make a lot of videos teaching people how to run Google ads. And we actually get people who try it on their own and then realize, okay, wow, this is way too confusing. Uh, I need some help. Or we'll get people who figure it out and then they never hire us, right? So that is just normal. Whatever type of content you create, there's going to be people who find value in it and then don't do business with you. That's just part of, that's just part of life. And that's not an excuse not to make that content. So something that I think is really important with whatever type of content you're making, whether you're doing reviews of products or services that you have, or whether you're, or I should say product, physical products, don't, don't reviews of services doesn't, doesn't work out too well. Um, but whatever you're doing, whether you're reviewing physical products you have in your store, you're doing a decision guide or you're doing an in-depth how-to guide is that it's Number one, completely objective. And number two, it legitimately doesn't hold anything back. So something that we do with our Google ads, um, 
tutorials is they're not designed to pull some little piece out where someone watches the video and everyone has this experience. They watch the video and they go, yeah, but what about that one part? Like, what do I do for that one part? And then you dig down the rabbit hole and you're like, oh, I have to buy your product or, oh, I have to buy your software or, oh, I have to, you know, jump on this, you know, paid webinar or whatever, whatever it, it may be. And so that second part is so important. And I think that's part of what's enabled us to be differentiated from everyone else is that we're not holding that 1% back because we're trying to force people to do business with us. The people that will do business with you will do business with you irrespective of whether that little golden nugget that makes everything works is in your content or not. So, you know, just be genuine and honest and don't hold anything back in your content. The good clients and customers will come to you anyway. And, and I like that mindset because in this world, there's very few people, like you said, who actually don't hold back. They're very like transactional. They give you just enough info and hey, buy my course to learn the rest. <laughs> what do you think of, uh, and, and there's definitely a movement against these fake gurus. You know, I've-, I've uh, There you know, is. <laughs> I've been following and I have fallen for a lot of these gurus in the past. Um, so I'm personally very angry at them because I've, uh, it's kind of embarrassing for me to say, but I think I've spent well over like $60,000 maybe 70,000 plus in like courses and masterminds within like the last three years. It's a lot of money, yeah. pretty much all my savings. I declare bankruptcy! Looking back, I could have been like, just try different things, run some ads maybe, and just use that money there. Um, Cause the info is out there, I feel like, if, if you do your research. It, it really is, especially when it comes to funnel building and paid advertising. Um, I mean, I think we have we have one digital product around, uh, uh, specifically around advertising and funnel building, and it's uh, how to write a an ad. Um, and that was simply because we just found we didn't find we couldn't find anything that did a good job of teaching people how to actually write ads properly for for Google. Um, but in terms of, of course that even even in and of itself you know you spend two or three hundred bucks on google ads you're gonna figure out how to write ads anyway so you know spending you know ten dollars on an ad writing course you're you're not really i, th I think one of the let me let me back up because i'm starting to ramble one of the really important things that i think you know you and i have learned out of those experiences is those don't shortcut anything like the courses the masterminds the live events they don't give you any information. They don't shortcut the process at all. So you might as well just watch the, the free content that's on YouTube, or if you really have the money, go hire someone to do it for you. Some, some of these courses and masterminds are so expensive, you could hire a professional to just get it done, which is what normal business owners do, right? Like yeah. you, you don't see CEOs of 100 to 300K a month companies going and figuring out how to run Facebook ads themselves. No, they go hire someone to do it for them. So if you really have that much cash, then your, your solution would be to go find and hire an expert. Of course, that's really hard and it takes a lot of trial and error, but so does everything else. Like you're, so I, I think the big selling point of, you know, you're going to save all this, this time or money by going to one of these larger courses. And I've, I've spent about half, half as much as, as uh, you have. So I, I understand that pain, you know, you're not really going to, to shortcut the process at all. And every time you're looking at that next course, you know, just think I could spend five or 20 K on this mastermind, or I could spend five or 20 K on advertising and actually figure something out and actually learn something specific to your business. And so uh, I think uh, you have a bunch of great books in the background there. You, you, I mean, you really can get all the, uh, all the information you can out of those those books. So, true. you know, it's, yeah. <laughs> That's absolutely true. And, and another thing about uh, these masterminds, I think there's some pros, like you get to network with a bunch of other people and stuff like that. But in my experience, the reason why I stopped going to masterminds or any of that stuff is a lot of the stuff they teach is a bit outdated. Like by the time, I mean, I'm sure you know how things change in marketing, like pretty much every six months, there's some update. Um, but I think by the time a lot of these uh, masterminds teach you the stuff, it's already kind of 
either everyone else is doing the same thing already so it's hard to stand out like everyone's copying each other yes. and um, if you want to be in, in on the on the like cutting edge then you got to be willing to test stuff that's the only you, you really yeah, I 100% agree with you. You really do. You have to, you know, as a marketer, you're a marketer and a scientist, right? You know, scientists, when they're researching something, they don't go to a mastermind to try and get the answer. They they look at the, the, the elements and ingredients that they have in front of them and then say, okay, what happens when we combine these two things? What happens when we add heat? What happens when we freeze it? And so that's how advertising works. You just say, what if like what about this what about that and you just keep testing over and over and over again and you're you're going to you're going to quickly figure out what works specific to you and your business so i wanted to one video and i think this is your most popular video on youtube is how do you grow your youtube channel using oh. video ads <laughs> and i personally um i kind of knew of the concept but didn't really know much about it until i saw your video and uh, you know, the $5 a day strategy using yes. discovery ads. So I wanted to ask you, like, what kind of results have you seen and who who would you recommend the, these kind of ads for? Like, if someone is, would you recommend this for someone who's brand new or would you recommend someone who has, like, maybe like 10, 20,000 subscribers? Good question. So I would not recommend it for someone who's brand new. I get a lot of questions on how many subscribers do I ha need to have or do I need to be part of the partner program before I turn this on. And I, I think the, the first thing is is tampering the expectations. Uh, I know I, I, I think I do an okay job tampering them. I, I know in the coming year we're, we're going to have to be a lot more explicit to say, please don't think that this is going to skyrocket you because <laughs> um, it, it really is, isn't. Uh, it's very, it can be very expensive. And so to answer the first to first part of your question in terms of how large should you be, uh, I think you should have at least 10 to 30 videos on your channel before you start any sort of advertising. And it's not about the view count or the subscriber count, it's more about the ability for YouTube to recommend content after you've paid for that um, view. And so something you can see inside of Google Analytics or Google Google Ads, I won't get too much into this, but you can actually see how many videos of yours people watch after they watch the ad. And so that's something that we pay a lot of attention to is because we don't just want people to watch the video and then go on with their merry way, right? We want someone to watch the video and then watch one of our other videos because that is an er that is a legitimate organic view in the eyes of YouTube. And so um, something with uh, that we do with our ad costs is we average the ad cost over how much we cost for the initial view and then how many we got on the second one. And sometimes we'll wind up finding that, wow, we're paying twice as much for this video, but people are watching twice as much more later on down the, the road. And so we'll keep paying this higher price because this video seems to allow people to continue to watch. And so that's why I look at it in terms of you need to have a certain number of videos uh, as opposed to number of subscribers or current view counts. Um, the the second part to answer that question is you need to consider why you're doing a youtube channel in the first place um, i think if you have a business on the back end where you already have a product or service then i think youtube ads to grow your channel makes a whole lot of sense because you're not just spending money on branding but you're actually can be promoting content that can directly help in the sales process like the content pieces we talked about earlier. And so I really like that strategy. What I am really wary of is people who just want to be YouTubers. Like they wanna be a YouTuber, so they, their income sources are going to be YouTube AdSense and then affiliate links in the description. Uh, as popular as my videos are and as little views as I would get if people actually believe this, I don't think it's a good idea for you to spend your money on YouTube ads. That just, it does not make sense. If you want to be a YouTuber, then spend your money on things to improve your content or spend your money on creating some sort of revenue model outside of affiliate links and um, YouTube AdSense. And then once you have that additional revenue model, 
then go back and look at YouTube ads. But uh, I think it's a it's a cart before the horse thing where you want to grow a channel and you're saying, okay, well, I'm going to grow a channel. I'm going to invest in this channel. And then like later on down the road, I'm going to have some sort of monetization. I don't, I don't I really don't think that's a good idea because I think you should know your business model and then invest in advertising, not invest in advertising so you can figure out your business model. Right. Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, a lot of people, uh, even though they might have a hobby channel, they might not even care about my diet, but they're so tied up with these vanity metrics that I need to get subscribers that they're, they get desperate sometimes. They really do. And I think the other thing, the other thing too, is that has to be part of the conversation is the, the, um, the CPMs because you're the amount of money that, uh, and I, I personally don't share revenue numbers just because I am terrified of being thrown in the fake guru camp. So I just stay away from them at all. So I, I'm not going to share mine personally, but I will say that there are some niches on YouTube where, you know, you're going to, you're going to be able to make five to 10 K a month with a uh, hundred thousand subscribers. Whereas in another niche, with the same 100,000 subscribers and maybe even twice the views, you're going to be lucky to make 1,000 or 3,000. And so one of the other things too is I, I think it's really important if someone wants to be a YouTuber and is looking to invest, you also be really, you have to be honest with yourself about how much money your channel is actually going to make in the long term. And I think this is why I'm so adamant about having a business model outside of just YouTube AdSense, because I think it's really easy for a lot of people to, there are really large YouTube channels with millions of views and millions of subscribers. And you know, they're pulling in numbers that are ridiculous. Like they're making, um, um, you know, 100K in like one month, right? But when you look at how many their, their actual CPM, if you do a, an analysis of that, you realize that it's not that high. You have to have that many views in order to have that income level. And so I think that's one of the other, and I bring this up because I think that might be part of why people are trying to just grow their channel. I 100% agree with you. Vanity metrics, I think is number one. They look at their subscriber count, they look at their view count, and they think that their worth is is based upon that. And I think that's a huge problem. Personally, I don't, I still do not look at the number of views my new videos get because it's only a couple hundred. I'm at 80 something thousand right now, but I only get a couple hundred views. Like you can't, you're gonna be depressed for all of time if you tie your worth to how many views your video gets in the beginning. Right. So right. I think that's something we have to disconnect ourselves from as entrepreneurs and, and YouTube creators. And then, you know, the, the second point I'm trying to make is like whatever niche or industry you're in, if you're in a situation where you're looking at YouTube AdSense and affiliates as the way you're going to make money, then do some really, really hard digging and find channels in your specific niche or industry that are actually sharing their numbers. Cause a lot of them do now. It used to be a taboo thing and now everybody does it cause they get so many views. So it shouldn't be, it shouldn't be too hard to find someone in your niche and pay attention to how much money they make per thousand views, not total per thousand views. And then look at how much money you could expect to make, you know, if you're getting, you know, 10 or a hundred thousand views a month. And I think for most people, unless you're in the marketing business or investing niche, you're going to find that those numbers are pretty depressing. And you're going to realize it's not a good idea to invest in YouTube ads to try and get to that, you know, income level that doesn't right. actually exist. So I realized that was, that was, that was a little off topic, but I just wanted to include that because I think people just have a really bad understanding of how much money they could actually make from AdSense. And that might be why they're gravitating towards spending money on ads before they actually have a, a, a revenue model set up. Right. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's the, ex I, I guess if you're in the marketing or business piece, the CPMs are higher because most of the advertisers that are willing to pay that money are like direct response marketers. So yeah. they know they're going to make that <laughs> money back. Oh, but, yeah. uh, one of my friends, uh, his name is Clark Kegley. He has a very big YouTube channel. Uh, yes. I'm familiar with his channel. I've never met him personally, but I am okay. familiar with his channel. Yeah. Yeah. We used to be in the same mastermind together and um, he likes to call your ad revenue as just a tip in the tip jar. <laughs> it's not your actual revenue or actual business because he has a business in the back end. But mm -hmm. that's a very good analogy. You know, don't think of, for most people, it's just going to be like an extra tip uh, that you're going to get. 
but really the potential is. is huge in the back end typically let's imagine like the person that is watching right now is maybe they haven't started yet they're thinking of starting a channel or they started but they're depressed with they're not getting the right, right views and in my experience and you can add in like maybe what your experience has been but in my experience the number one thing most people lack is they don't make the right kind of videos for the audience they either make like random videos that no one even searches for um or you know they 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 have no idea about like what the what problem they're solving out there specifically if they're a business so how can people get started in terms of like complete beginner or they're not getting the views they want how can they get started with getting clarity about these are the kinds of videos i need to be created great yeah that's uh i'd say that's a real tough one so i'm i'm going to try this analogy and we'll, we'll we'll see we'll see if it works um so if you think the the first thing is to accept is that when you start a youtube channel you're making content for other people you're not making content for yourself so if you're making content for yourself then you really don't have any excuse to be complaining about subscribers or views because you're making content for you and if that's what you enjoy doing and you're just doing the content that you enjoy then treat it as a hobby look at it as a hobby and you just ignore all the metrics and, and have fun but i'd say 99.9% of the people that are looking to start a youtube channel are not in that camp and so you have to view it as you are making content for a specific person and so who are you making content for and how do you fit into their channels so i like to think of it as a a uh, a bench right so everyone has a bench of um shows or channels that they like to go to for a specific type of content and so when you turn on the discovery channel you know you're not expecting to see an action movie you're expecting to see something about space or animals right and so when you go to make your channel not only do you need to figure out who you specifically want to make content for and what problems that they have but you also need to think about how do i fit in in the context of everything else that they're watching so most people they watch they they have some sort of television shows that they enjoy then they have youtube and then they're scrolling on facebook and instagram right so right out of the bat you already know that they have all these other things that they're paying attention to and you're you're in the youtube block right so when it comes to creating content um don't worry about what's on other platforms because you only need to worry about when they feel when your ideal customer feels like watching you or ideal viewer I should say when your ideal viewer feels like watching youtube you're being compared with other youtube things you're not being compared with they're they're not sitting there like am I going to watch netflix or disney plus or am I going to go to youtube I don't think you should be cons- you should be thinking at that high a level. Um I think you should just be focused on what's going on on YouTube. With on YouTube itself, how does your content fit into the context of everything else that they're watching? So when they come to YouTube, are you looking to entertain? Are you looking to educate? Are you looking to inform? And so I'll I'll use a an actual example. You know, when as entrepreneurs, when we come to YouTube typically, we're either working on actively working on a project and we're saying okay this website's not working i need some help with it or we're just generally browsing what's going on in new like entrepreneur specific news like developments what's what's going on what's tesla doing what's uh you know nvidia doing or what's the latest you know huawei thing right so then and then we also have motivational stuff like the the vlogs where we go and watch some of the big entrepreneur vloggers who just talk about whatever is going on in their business. And so those those are three quick examples and you have to decide how do you fit first of all you have to decide what are those examples in your specific uh niche and then how do you fit in? Um for me, you know, we focus on people who are coming to YouTube because they have a specific problem. No one goes to YouTube the YouTube browse page and says, "You know, I want to learn how to install analytics today." Like that that's just not something someone wants to do but when they're actively trying to figure out how to install analytics they're going to go to youtube and they're going to search how to install analytics that's where we want to come up and that's where we focus on and so if you're creating content that is specific to helping someone in their journey towards a result that they're looking for then you should be 
100% focused on YouTube search and SEO. Um, if you're creating that more um, suggested style of content where you want to be making vlogs or you want to be making you know, motivational things, I'm still in the entrepreneur example here, then going to the YouTube search box is not going to be a good way to figure out what to make because people aren't going to the search box to search for motivation. They're not going to search and saying motivational video because I feel like I need to be motivated right now. <laughs> um, they're letting suggested tell them they're going through suggested videos and they're scrolling through their feed looking for something to to pick them up because they, they need a little bit of a dopamine hit. And so in that regard, then you should focus on suggested. Now, I'm not an expert at all in suggested because we don't ever try to get suggested or, or, or anything of that nature because we're hundred percent focused on, on search. And so I think my, uh, my example definitely fell apart there. The, the point is to really focus on choose who you want to provide value to and then decide where you want to really focus your content. Are you coming in on search where they're searching for a specific question and you're answering it? Or are you just trying to make generalized, more generalized suggested content where they're scrolling and they're like, oh, that would be interesting, let me watch that. And so I think those would be the, the two. I apologize, that was, <laughs> no, that, didn't that's come together perfect. right. But. That's perfect, yeah, that's perfect. And. Yeah, you're right. I mean, uh, I, I mean, even going through a course, I really like the fact that you just mentioned for search content, just go to the YouTube search bar and look up what keywords come up because yep. if YouTube is suggesting it, that means people <laughs> are searching for it. So that's, and also I, I didn't know one thing that you mentioned was uh, that YouTube doesn't really share their search volume data, which we all assume that they do. And we buy all these tools and softwares to, you know, but you're right, I did some research on that and they actually don't release that. When you, when did you actually start your channel? What, which year? Yeah, that's a, so I actually had to, I had to look this up this morning. So I believe I started it around 26, in 2016. And I posted one video a week um, where I just sat down and I talked about the funnel that I, I was building a, a webinar funnel. So even in 2016, I was I was still a little trapped in the fake guru, the, the fake guru wheel, where I was I was trying one more time. And so in that series, it, it ran for about I think 50 videos, and each week I just sat down and I was sharing what I was doing with um, my funnel that I was building at the building at the time. So spoiler alert: the funnel didn't work. I blew my savings on the Facebook ads and made a really embarrassing video saying this is what I would do if I had more money, but I'm, I'm out of money. And um, I was I had uh, I was working at the a marketing agency at, at that time. So uh, then in 2017, I would say that's when I really started taking it seriously. I made my first vlog in January of 2017. Um, and been vlogging somewhat consistently ever since then. I think we're on 210 or 213 uh, now. And so just to give some context in terms of how long it takes to actually grow, uh, I made sure I had the numbers here. So I started in, I would say January of 2017, and it took until August of that year to get my first thousand subs. And then it took until March of 2018, so from August to March, uh, to get the five to get to 5,000, and then from March to July to get to 10,000. So it definitely started snowballing. Uh, but I pretty much um, went a year. I mean, if we start from when I started, pretty much took a year and a half to get to the, to the first thousand subscribers. Um, so it uh, <laughs> it was very very slow. And then did, did you ever feel like giving up in between or were you like feeling discouraged or were you like okay with not having those numbers but just focusing on the bigger picture? Uh, I, I, I was definitely discouraged. Um, I don't think that I ever got to the point of giving up. Uh, I think I was, at that point, I was really at my wit's end. I, I looked at this and I saw other channels who had been successful and I, I was looking at this saying, okay, the the model works growing a youtube channel works so if something's not working it's me it's 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 not the it's not the platform and it, when it comes to when it comes to those moments i think one of the one of the easiest things you can do on yourself for growing a channel is you as as the entrepreneur and creator you choose your key performance indicators and so you know going back to the vanity metrics 
my key performance indicator was getting that one video up a week and then it was doing the one vlog a week and then it was doing the two or three content videos a week and so i think in terms of staying motivated um it has to be your output um it can't be number of subscribers it can't be the number of views because you don't have control over that nobody has control over that uh, even a channel with 10 million subscribers, they don't have any control over how many people YouTube decides to suggest that video to. They just, they, they don't. And so the only thing that we can control is our actions. And so I think what uh, kept me motivated was sticking to that number of posts per week or per month. And that was, that was my goal. That was my indicator. There were a lot of late nights. There were a lot of crummy videos. Um, in fact, just to, to kind of give some encouragement, the video that you mentioned about the $5 a day YouTube ads, that video was recorded on a day where I had no idea what to talk about. And I just had to meet my quota for the week. And I was looking around and I was pulling my hair out. Like, I don't know what to talk about. And I had just done a YouTube video two weeks prior. So I was telling myself, ah, I shouldn't talk about YouTube ads again. I just need something. And uh, I saw a, uh, I don't remember where it was, but I, I was just desperately looking for any sort of idea. And I saw another channel that had done a $5 a day. Um, I don't even remember what it was. It wasn't related to advertising. It was like $5 a day for something else. And I, I looked at that and I went, okay, you know what? Well, let's just do a $5 a day YouTube ads campaign, right? And that's been one of the most successful videos. And the only reason that was made, the only reason that video was made was because I stuck to the goal of I had to get X number of videos out, no matter how crummy I thought they were, no matter how dumb I thought the idea was, I just, it was number of occurrences. And so it's, uh, I think that's really what can help keep you motivated and on track. <laughs> Cause you never know what's gonna work. That's amazing. I think it's definitely focusing more on the process than, than the results because you, you can't really control the results anyway, you know. And my experience has been somewhat similar. Like I started making videos on YouTube about fitness back in the day because I was going through my fitness transformation. Um, which is you know, amazing, which was amazing, by the way. Oh, did you see that? <laughs> oh. uh, yeah, I, I binge watched a couple of your videos um, okay. earlier this morning. That was, yeah. <laughs> But one of my most popular videos is on like how to squat, but it's a more long tail keyword. It's like how to squat with long femurs, meaning if you have longer legs, it's it's a bit of a different technique. Um, I did you not, I recorded the voiceover. I, I had no idea what I was doing back then. And I just recorded straight out of my, my laptop. And I, I recorded the voiceover in my car. Like I was, I was outside my gym. I think I was waiting for someone or something. And I thought, yeah, I have some time. And I just started doing a voiceover in my car because it's you can roll up the windows, right? Just so kind of yeah. quiet in there. And uh, yes. that video got like thirty thousand plus views just organically. <laughs> and That's now, amazing. <laughs> And, uh, you know, if, if I would have procrastinated and I still struggle with this, uh, you know, if I would have procrastinated and thought, oh, I need to buy a good mic before I can do a voiceover, then I would have never put out that video. And uh, that kind of reminds me of this book called The War of Art. I don't know if you've read it. The War. Of I have Art. not read that one. Okay. It's, uh, it's by this author. It's not The Art of War. It's The War of yeah. Art. It's a play on words. But it, it's by this author named Stephen Pressfield. And it's amazing. It's designed for anyone who is on a creative pursuit, whether you're an artist or musician or entrepreneur. Whenever the book talks about the concept of resistance, which is whenever you try to do something or, or work towards your goals, you're going to be faced with your own resistance. That's going to tell you yes. otherwise. And every day you go, it's a war. You go against battle against your own self. But if you can consistently overcome your own resistance and like you said, focus on the process, that is a form of overcoming resistance. Um, then that's that's the way you do it. So I'm, I'm so glad you gave that example. So it Sounds like a, a great book. Yeah, I, have, I haven't read it, but um, yeah, I would I would absolutely agree with that. <laughs> yeah, it's a very short read. I, I would recommend anyone to read it. It's very short, very um, easy to read. Uh, do you read books, by the way, do you, or are you more of a experiment? <laughs> kind of? 
I used to I used to read a lot, and I don't say this out of arrogance, um, but it got to the point where I felt like the books started to repeat themselves. And so for for me, I try to instead of going for a number of books, I try to find one that is that is really important or or someone you know recommends to me and then take a really deep dive. Um, and so right now, I think I've only read three books this year, uh, but I read each one of them twice. And um, then I went through and took really copious notes. Um, kind of outlining so I make sure that I really digest the book and I think that I, th I think for me that's been much more helpful in terms of learning because I, I think something that I used to do is you know it, it's just kind of like burning through courses where I just read a book and then okay next one next one next one and it's like well what about the application and so um, looking for th this year I've been really focused on um, productivity style books and really applying what I've been learning so um, I've read the one thing uh, again I think I've probably read that book at least five times now <laughs> uh, but that's been my favorite one by far so the one thing um, by Gary Keller and Jay Papson, then Deep Work by Cal Newport. Uh, I also read Simon Sinek's new book, The Guy Who Wrote Start With Why. Uh, I didn't enjoy that one as, as, as much. I only read that one once. Uh, and then right now I'm reading uh, Psycho Cybernetics, and I do not remember who the, the author is because I'm, I'm, I'm reading that. Yes, yeah. yeah. So uh, I'm reading that one right now. Um, and then I, I have an audible subscription. So sometimes I'll just, you know, quickly listen to books. I listen to, uh, David, uh, David Asprey's book, um, headstrong. Um, it's, uh, you know, well, you, you're, you're familiar with keto. So, um, it's essentially applying keto principles to make your brain, uh, work better and, and faster throughout the, throughout the day. So I think reading books is really good, but I think you have to get to a point where you need to find the ones that make the most impact for you and then reread them and then take notes and then actually start applying what you've learned and tracking your progress just like you would you wouldn't just read a book about working out and then go to the next workout book you would read the book and then go try the workouts and see how and see how they work and track your progress and i think you need to approach um reading reading in the same way absolutely I think uh, Gary Vee calls it like you can't read about doing push-ups. You gotta do something. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <Pretty. laughs> no, it's 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 true though. I've been in that camp. It's it comes out of fear. You know, we're afraid of failing, so we uh, we're stuck in this loop of just learning, 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 and never actually doing it. But we all know that if you want to build muscle, you gotta put in the reps. It's the yep. same philosophy. You gotta lift the weights, get stronger, get better over time. Absolutely. Absolutely. So true. Last question I want to ask you was how in, in this day and age uh, where a lot of these I feel fake gurus are being called out and it's a big trend and I, I like that, you know, it keeps people accountable. But how do you separate yourself as not being classified as another guru out there who's just trying to because I feel like a lot of people, they whenever you talk about sales, or marketing the people get turned off very easily especially yeah. the newer generation they don't people people don't want to be sold to and I, I i'm that way too you know if i if i watch content i don't want to watch content just to be upsold something or you know so it, in this day and age i think how i guess the just to frame the question better how do you um come off as authentic uh you know non-transactional that hey if you if you want, I like this video, you have got to buy my course. So, you know, it's not transactional. And also, how do you stand out from genuinely giving value and not being attached to some sort of sale or something, trying to sell them something? That's a good question. Uh, I think, <laughs> I think the answer is, I don't think it's possible. As soon as you start selling, there's going to be a group of people, whether it's your audience, whether it's critics, as soon as you start selling, they're going to, um, they're going to be negative about it. And I think it comes down to deciding how, how you are able to sleep at night and then how 
much your content can stand on its own. So this is this is kind of the philosophy that uh, we go with. And we look at any piece of content that we create as, okay, if they didn't buy a single thing from us, would this still would they still be able to completely achieve the result that they're looking for? So I'll go back to you know Google Ads again because that's that's an easy one for me. So if someone doesn't want to pay us for services, if someone doesn't want to buy our Excel sheets or buy our copywriting course, would they be able to successfully run a campaign as a result of just watching this one 25 or 45 minute video? So as long as the answer is yes, then you know, I'm able to sleep at night, my business partner is able to sleep at night, I'm pretty sure everyone else on the team is able to sleep at night. But as soon as we go, if we were to make a video uh, and then say, okay, by the way, here's how you set up this campaign, but really it's only gonna work if you, you know, use our software or use our Excel sheet because we're, I'm telling you to, to do something that's gonna take three hours. Um, then I think that's where you you kind of cross over to, all right, well now you're just being transactional and you're kind of trying to trap people into doing something that's going to result in them having to to pay you in order for it to be successful but i think in terms of in terms of those groups there's and, and this is this is part of why i personally i don't ever say any names and i, I don't actually part even though i agree with a lot of what's going on with the the channels the channel you mentioned um i don't say anything about it um because i think that everyone has a different line and unfortunately, at the end of the day, it is an opinion, right? There are some of those people who are selling those courses and saying those things, and they 100% legitimately believe that what they're doing is ethical. And it doesn't matter how many thousands of us look at them and say, this is wrong. Like you're taking people's life savings, you're straight up lying to them. They honestly believe that they're doing something that's okay. Um, and so when you, <laughs> when you finally accept that, that that's possible, um, you realize that you're not going to be able to make everyone happy. And so you have to make sure that you're able to sleep at night and your content um, can stand on its own, completely independent of what you're selling. And I think as long as you have those two things, um, you're going to be okay. And you're, you're just, people are gonna be upset that you sell stuff. There's always gonna be someone who says, why don't you give it to me for free? Absolutely. Uh, no, I think that that's amazing. And, and that's absolutely right. I think you have to be sold on your own product, even though otherwise you can't really be that successful. So I, I genuinely think these people do believe in that they are doing a great service. Um, but, you know, it is an opinion, though. I mean, <laughs> you know, who knows? Maybe we're the wrong one. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we're just uh, fools for getting our stuff for free. And yeah. we could be making millions of dollars or buying Lamborghinis and whatnot. So. <laughs> <laughs> awesome.